the citizen advocacy scheme was uh, designed in response to the age-old complaint of uh, parents of handicapped children. What will happen to my child when I'm gone? In some way or another, uh, this is what, what you hear parents uh, saying and worrying about. And, uh, and associated with that concern is, uh, uh, is one, who will love my child when I am gone? And you know, you, the child may be very impaired and uh, maybe not one that would be easily sought out by other people on purpose. Uh, um, and, uh, and so it's very realistic for a lot of parents to, to ask that question. Uh, Again, there, there were, was a series of coincidences in the late 1960s. Uh, uh, one was that my dean, uh, Robert Kugel, uh, was invited to uh, a national conference of about 25 people who were leaders in, uh, in issues concerned with uh, so-called protective services. Um, and, uh, and provisions, long-term provisions for uh, impaired uh, persons uh, and for uh, planning uh, uh, what would happen to a person after the demise of their parents. And he could not go and uh, he uh, pointed me to uh, stand in for him in, um, in, uh, in the, to the, for this conference, which happened to be uh, near Pittsburgh. And uh, it was a most instructive and revealing uh, event where you had uh, these uh, leaders, um, very smart people, many national parent uh, leaders and um, uh, lawyers and, and so on, uh, come together from many uh, different areas, not just mental retardation, but there was cerebral palsy and there was aging and... and uh, um, and a few other uh, groups were represented, all, uh, all uh, focusing on what, what can be done uh, to uh, protect the welfare of uh, people over the long run and, uh, and uh, in their private lives and outside the service system. <clears throat> of course, in those days there weren't many services other than institutions. <clears throat> and uh, of course that was, I think, 1967. Um, and it was a very depressing meeting. Speaker after speaker came up, um, presented uh, their idea, and, uh, and then documented that nothing along the line had actually been done. Uh, it was just an idea, and uh, nothing had uh, come of it. And a few ideas that had uh, been tried to be implemented uh, weren't working. Uh, several laws had been passed, and uh, um, uh, and they they were on the books uh, and um, and were not used. Uh, the one law in one state uh, on um, uh, on how to protect uh, people and uh, against abuse and so on, uh, um, and over the long run had never ever been invoked and used and. So some of these provisions were guardianship type, just different legal arrangements, you know, different improvements on guardianship provisions, for instance, um, to make guardianship a less all or nothing affair. And in those days it was all or nothing. Uh, so a gradation of, of guardianship uh, was proposed, which now, of course, we have that. Uh, that was an idea that uh, was eventually implemented. Um, and uh, others uh, proposed uh, creating special organizations that would take on a sort of a paternal oversight role over a handicapped person and, and on and on. And uh, it was such a depressing conference. And at the end, uh, I, I was just an observer. I was very young. Um, uh, and, uh, and these people were veterans. Uh, some of them, you know, as I said, parents of handicapped children with long involvement and experience and so on. So it, it was a bit presumptuous of me to uh, to ask for the floor. And 
I, I proposed that, uh, that uh, several elements that had been discussed you know, of different provisions be uh, uh, stripped of their context and recombined in a different way, which was in essence the forerunner of the citizen advocacy scheme. It was a proposal that that um, parents actually, <coughs> initially at least, uh, parents be recruited to voluntarily take on a uh, uh, something like a godparent role uh, to uh, another uh, set of parents uh, uh, handicapped a young adult or, or maybe not no longer young adult but a, a couple or, or parents who who were elderly and could no longer really take care of uh, of uh, things uh, would in other words uh, uh, begin to rely on uh, the assistance of uh, young parents who also had a handicapped child uh, who were willing to take on a second concern um, protective concern for a an older handicapped uh, person um, and um, and this idea sounded outlandish to these experts. Uh, in essence, I said, you know, we didn't choose to be parents of a handicapped person. We would never have uh, selected or wanted this role. And to imagine that another person would voluntarily take that on is, is kind of absurd. Uh, so that was the end of that for the moment. But when I got home, I refined the idea and uh, added one element, which was uh, that it didn't just have to be a parent, that it could, an ordinary citizen might be recruited to uh, voluntarily uh, assume that role on an unpaid basis. And secondly, uh, that a, a citizen advocacy office be established, which in contrast to the unpaid volunteers, uh, would have paid staff, and their role would be to recruit the unpaid volunteers and to give them backup, because uh, uh, if you represented a devalued person, you would undoubtedly get into trouble with all sorts of authorities, because you would be asking for things that were good for that person. The authorities would, uh, uh, characteristically, especially in those days, would take an adversarial position. Uh, so there would be conflict, and uh, in this conflict, uh, you needed some backup. Uh, ordinary citizens might uh, might um, uh, be a little bit at sea, but what what to do? And so the paid staff, in addition to recruiting the volunteers, would provide that uh, backup. Uh, but the whole the whole scheme would be totally independent from the service system and uh, would be free from conflict of interest so that even the funding for the office, for the, the, the few paid people in such an office, would have to come from a source that was not uh, in a conflict of interest position vis-a-vis -vis the kinds of authorities that an advocate might have to confront. And that, by the way, has always been the, uh, the Achilles heel of citizen advocacy because um, uh, funding that uh, comes without an attachment of conflict of interest is extremely, extremely difficult to obtain. Uh, the vast majority of uh, funds, such as go to service systems, come with uh, attached conflicts of interest of all sorts. But anyway, uh, that idea did catch on in many quarters. Uh, I was asked to speak on it uh, all over um, North America and even abroad, and uh, soon there were efforts to uh, initiate citizen advocacy offices uh, all over uh, North America, um, and there was a blossoming for a while of such uh, offices. <coughs> but uh, but the uh, problem was that, uh, you know, with f few exceptions, uh, there wasn't much of a of a national uh, entity to to promote this. Uh, for a while, the National Association for Retarded Children uh, promoted it, uh, 
for a while the National Institute of Mental Retardation in Canada uh, promoted it, but these efforts eventually fell by the wayside, and and so uh, uh, the the efforts at dissemination and uh, promotion, you know, fell on uh, uh, people like myself doing this on the site. You know, for what they, whatever else they would normally do and regularly do and were paid to do, uh, we had to do that on the side. And uh, and surprisingly, the parent associations, uh, after uh, an initial burst of interest, did not make long-term commitments to the idea, which was very unwise and is continues to be unwise. Uh, that they will often throw their efforts behind all sorts of uh, service schemes, uh, but not to something that is uh, outside the service system and, um, and that deals with uh, an issue that is not dealt with by anybody else. Uh, and the problem is still not solved. Uh, we today have, uh, uh, in the United States alone, uh, many hundreds of thousands of, of uh, mentally retarded uh, older adults whose parents are near the end of uh, their functionality. The elderly, uh, they're dying, and here uh, several hundred thousand uh, people who had a protective presence in their life, was committed to them, uh, will end up in essence, being swallowed by the service system without an independent uh, advocacy presence, uh, uh, without somebody who does not have a conflict of interest, uh, who is totally committed to their welfare and speaks on their on their behalf. Uh, so um, we still have some citizen advocacy offices going in various places, and including in, for instance, Australia and so on. Uh, but uh, the movement is much much weaker than it, it was for a while in the early 1970s. One of the, the dogmas of the citizen advocacy movement had been get multi-source funding. Do not rely on single sources, uh, but uh, get as many different sources as you can, because when one source dries up, you will have other sources. And again, uh, a lot of the people running the offices, the board members primarily, um, to some degree, the, uh, the directors of the offices uh, were not far-sighted enough to take that serious. And when they were comfortable at the moment with a particular source, uh, they, they did not, they quit attending to diversification and, uh, uh, um, and, and long-term uh, 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 money raising. Well, um, in, in, many, in many ways, I, I've looked on citizen advocacy as it. Uh, not that it has been a great worldly success, uh, the way it is now uh, just barely hanging on, uh, but, uh, but in that it has managed to call forth thousands of people to step up on a voluntary, unpaid basis and put themselves on the line uh, on behalf of one other very, very dependent and society devalued person and uh, to ally themselves with that person in, in uh, often such heroic uh, action. And uh, that's been one of the more, more satisfying uh, things that I look back on.